Warm greetings to all the viewers. Welcome to Bhutan e-learning project. I'm Jimmy Tilley and today I'll be taking you through history key stage 4 for classes 9 and 10. So today you will be learning about art and then you will be learning about architecture also. So under this you are also going to learn different subtopics like under art we have the different forms of art and then the features of the Bhutanese art and then under architecture you are also going to study the characteristics of the Bhutanese architecture as well as you are also going to study about the different forms of architecture so by the end of this session you should be able to fulfill objectives so what I would expect you to learn by the end of this session is that you should be able to explain the features of Bhutanese art and architecture then you should be able to discuss the different forms of Bhutanese art and architecture. So now first, let us look at the features of the Bhutanese art. So when I say art, I'm going to focus on the Bhutanese paintings. So now, under the Bhutanese paintings, we have several features which I'm going to discuss on. The first feature that I was mentioning about the Bhutanese painting, about the Bhutanese painting being religious in nature having a didactic function. Now what is didactic function? When I say didactic function, it means that Bhutanese paintings are usually associated with Mahayana Buddhism. So paintings are more aimed at giving spiritual lessons to the people rather than focusing on whether who painted it or who did the work. So that's why we find that the Bhutanese art usually gives lots of spiritual ideas related to religion. Now if you look at this example, here we find the four harmonious friend. The moment we look at the four harmonious friend, we have the idea that we need to have unity, we need to have cooperation and then we need to work together. So this is one simple example of how the didactic function is. The second feature that I was mentioning is about the Bhutanese art being anonymous. So what does anonymous mean? Anonymous means that in Bhutanese painting, we never find the inscription of the painter written at the end of the art. If we look at the Western art, we usually associate the art with the painter. But in the Bhutanese form of art, what we do is we usually associate the painting with the person who has sponsored the painting. The artist, the work of the artist here is just to express his skill rather than to glorify himself. So that is why Bhutanese art is anonymous. We never know who did the artwork. Third feature of the Bhutanese form of art is painter versus jinda. So here, what does jinda mean? So what does jinda here mean? Jinda is usually the sponsor of the painting. So here, aesthetic dimension plays a subsidiary role. It is more to do with gaining merit than showcasing the talent of the artist. So that's why we never find the inscription of the artist. Rather, we find the inscription of the sponsors or the jinda. So here, what does this mean? Usually in the Buddhist con context, we associate with doing good works like renovation of temples, like constructing thagangs. All these things are associated with gaining merit. So a person who sponsors painting also believes that they will gain merit. As for the painter, they are focused only on painting and they also believe that with the painting they have done, they also gain some merit. Fourth feature that I will discuss here is that our Bhutanese painters, they usually follow iconography. So what is iconography? So iconography, there are a set of rules that a painter must strictly adhere to it. If the painter goes beyond what they are meant to do, then they are 
usually associated with non-adherence to the iconograph. So they consider this as a sin and it will nullify whatever work they have done. Now you have seen the features of Bhutanese painting. So here I pose you a question. Since you have seen all the features of the Bhutanese art, among these features, which feature strikes you the most? So you can probably think over it and then work on it. Now, next we are going to look at the raw materials for obtaining paint. So in order for the painter to paint, they need some raw materials. So what are some of the raw materials that they need? Some of the important raw materials that the painter needs for obtaining paint are soil, then next we have mineral, and then we have the vegetable. Once the raw materials are ready, then the primary colors are obtained. The four primary colors are white, yellow, red, and gray. All these colors are obtained from different parts of the country. Like for example, white is obtained from Paro, then yellow is obtained from the areas of Gaza and Bumtang, then we have the red soil from Tashigang and Wangdifodrang, and then we have the gray soil which is obtained from Pensulin. All these primary colors, they are mixed together to form secondary colors. Now, the other raw material that is needed and is very essential for the paintings to be made is paint brushes, or they are the paint brushes. Now, paint brushes, they are obtained from either the fur of the animal or they are in modern times made from synthetic ones. The paint brushes for finer and thinner lines are obtained from cat fur and for the thicker brushes, they use the pig bristles. So now, the next thing that we are going to look at is the different forms of painting. So what are the different forms of paintings? Now there are three different forms of painting. They are the statue painting, they are the wall painting, and then they are the scroll painting. So we are going to look at all these three forms of painting individually. So the first one that we are going to study is about the statue painting. So what is the statue painting? Usually we find the statue paintings in the temples, in the monasteries, in the dongs, and of course in our private houses also. All these statues are either made from clay, they are made from bones, or they are made from the metal. Sometimes bronze is cast and then in the market today we mostly find the bronze statues. Now for the clay statues, they are painted all over but when it comes to the statues that are made from either bones or the metal they are painted only on the eyes then on the head and on the hands just to highlight now let us look at what is wall painting wall paintings they are also known as frescoes or debris painting now these wall paintings are mostly seen in temples, monasteries, and zones. So in order to paint the wall, we have to follow some process. So what are these processes? Now, firstly, the wall is plastered, then it is left to dry, and after that, on the dried wall, canvas is pasted, and then that canvas is also left to dry, after which, the paint is being done once it is fully dried. Sometimes, after plastering the wall and it is left to dry, people, they directly paint. There is no need for the canvas to be put upon. The third form of art is known as the scroll painting or the tanka painting. They are drawn on a canvas and they are stretched out, drawn on a wooden frame and then on that grid lines are drawn after which they follow the iconography so that the painting comes out as per the strict rules that they need to adhere the scroll painting which is known as tanka they are either in the general size that we see in the homes and the temples and the larger size they are known as thongrel these thongrels are the huge 
hankas that are displayed only on occasions like shabdam kuche on occasions like buddha spari nirvana and the occasions that are associated with religion so these thongrel the moment we see it is believed that it is going to liberate us from the samsara in order to make the thongrel we usually use the ablic technique so what is ablic technique this i am going to discuss in the next part we are going to look at the techniques of the scroll painting so there are three techniques which involves number one the xylographic block number two the pin prick or the pounds or the spray pattern and then we have the applique technique so what are these three we have the xylographic block method where we carve out the letters or where we carve out the images that we want upon that we spray the ink and then press it with either a canvas or a piece of paper upon which the image or the letters are being transferred so that is xylographic block now the second one that we have is pounds or spray pattern or we can say it is the pin prick method so here in this method what we do is we usually pin prick the stencil and then this stencil is transferred upon another paper whereby on a piece of cloth we put in the chalk or we put in powdered clay and then pounds upon the stencil whereby the image is directly transferred on another sheet so that way the image is being reproduced so this is the pin prick method and the third and the final method of scroll painting is the applique technique so what is the applique technique in thongrel we usually find the applique technique being made so this applique technique is a kind of technique where embroidery is being used so different pieces of clothes are stitched together and then together they are made into thongrel or thangkas in zongkha we usually call that technique as chemzo now we are done with the art part let us look at the architecture segment so in this segment first i will tell you a brief history of how architecture evolved in our country and then we are going to look at the different features of the architecture as well as we are also going to look at the different forms as i have mentioned so first in order to know about the architecture we need to understand a brief history about it it is believed that in bhutan the first recorded forms of building happened during the time of tibetan king known as songsen gambo it is mentioned in the thadul and yangdul book that songsen gambo built two temples in bhutan and they are kichulhagang in paro and then jambalhagang in pomthang these two temples are said to be the oldest in bhutan from 11th to 17th century we find that many eminent lamas have visited our country among those one of the most popular builders at that time was lam ngaung chogyal who had built many temples in western bhutan we also find thongthong gyalpo building not only temples but bridges also after that we also find the arrival of shabdung who has introduced the zong system so today if we look at most of the temples and monastery around our country we find that the basic pattern of these temples are usually associated with the zongs that have been built by shabdung after the enthronement of our first king we find that the royal family also took patronage in building different structures around our country now let us look at the characteristics or the features of the bhutanese architecture so what are some of the characteristics of bhutanese architecture so now if we look at the bhutanese architecture or any building we find that there is a lavish use of woods then we also find that the window size it increases with the stories and then we also find that the shapes of the windows are in trefoil and then we also find that walls are sloped and they are also whitewashed so these are some of the features of the bhutanese architecture now let us look at what are the different types of buildings that we see in our country first one we have lagangs so these lagangs they are usually one or 
two stories high and then they are covered with paintings inside and around the lagoon we also find an enclosed courtyard sometimes we also find the residence of the lam or the monks around the temple and one striking feature of the temples around our country is that they have gilded ornament on the top of the roof and they are also known as the serto next one we have the monasteries so monasteries are larger in size as compared to temple so there are two types of monasteries they are the cluster type and they are the zong type so what is the cluster type and what is the zong type now in cluster type we see one or temple housed in a single building around that building we also find the residence of the lama or the monks the examples of the cluster type of monasteries we can see at zondakha in paro and fajuding in thimphu then on the other side we have the zong type of monastery with the basic pattern of uchi that is similar to the zong so within that uh, uchi we find many temples housed in together so around the central tower we also find the residence of the monks and the lamas so the best examples of monastery that is associated with the zong type is at gantu gembo in wangdi fodrong and then the talo monasteries they are based on the zong type of monastery the next form of building that we have is the zong type they are usually gigantic then they have massive walls and the walls are usually sloped and then we have the basic pattern that is uchi and then we also have the zongs being richly decorated with woodworks so these are some of the features that we see in a zong another type of building in buddhist architecture and then we have the chotens the chotens they are usually built in memory of eminent lamas or personalities like for example we have the thimphu memorial choten which is being built by gayum ajifensu choten in memory of her son king jimidoji wonchu then we have some chotens which are also built in order to subdue evil spirits in the region so like for example we have the choten at chimilaga which was built in order to subdue the demoness that was causing harm in the region then the next form of architecture that we see is the money walls they are the stone walls which is carved with mantras associated with the riksum gembo and then sometimes we can also see the simple mantras of om mani padme hum on the money walls and then next one form of building that we see in architecture is the palaces these palaces we find mostly in the areas of bomtang and then tongsa if we look at the features of the palaces we will find that these palaces resemble a kind of zong because the design features are quite similar to that of zong it is also richly decorated with woodwork surrounded by a courtyard then the central building is the place where the master or the lord res resides so sometimes we also find that around the palaces there are smaller buildings that house the slaves or the workers or the servants now we have the village houses these are the common features of the bhutanese architecture because it is for the common people now if you look at the features of the bhutanese house you will find that they are rectangular in shape they are usually 2 to 3 stories high and each floor they are having specific functions like for example usually the first floor or the top floor is used as a chapel or the place where people sleep and then the middle floor is used for storage or kitchen and then we find the ground floor used for housing the animals so with this we have studied the architecture segment 2 so now let us try to recall what we have studied today we have studied about art and we have studied about architecture so under the art part we have studied the features as well as the different forms of art
in the architecture section we have looked at the features of the Bhutanese architecture and then we also have studied the different types of buildings that we find in Bhutanese architecture so with this before I leave let us try to explore questions that you can work upon so if you look at the different form of painting you find that the wall painting is very complex so why do you think that these wall painting is very complex and then you can also explore on the Bhutanese architecture being very unique so how can you evaluate that With this I have come to the end of my session I hope you had a great time and I hope to see you in the next segment of the e-learning project thank you <laughs>